Of course, it is Wednesday. It is hump day, and that means each and every Wednesday we are joined to talk Eagles and more with Dave Weinberg. He joins us each and every Wednesday for a Weinberg Wednesday here on 97.3 ESPN. We got a lot to get to with Dave today because since the last time I talked to Dave, some things have changed in the boxing world. So we got to get to that stuff as well. And as always, Dave joins us live in virtual living cover on Facebook, virtual living color. Easy for me to say on Wednesday on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Dave, how are you doing today? Doing well, Josh. How are you? Doing pretty good. So obviously when it comes to the Eagles, they can't stay out of the headlines. They can't, we can't escape them. But the good news is they're on the field. They're doing some practicing. And I want to get your take on, we talked about a little bit at the end of last week after I had you on. Do you give credit to Nick Sirianni for calling the players and saying, hey, what do you want? And finding a way to get them in the building on the field for three weeks and saying, listen, if you don't want mini camp, you don't want 11 on 11, that's fine. But I still want you here. Yeah, I do give him a lot of credit for, for, for reaching a compromise. I mean, I don't know if there's a lot of teams that have been able to do that. Um, but yeah, the, especially in their situation with the new coaching staff, a lot of new players, uh, they need all the time they can together to, to get things right, you know, learn the system, get comfortable with each other. Um, so, yeah, I give, them, I give them a lot of credit for being able to do that. I mean, that, obviously there's no 11 on 11 or so on 7, so you really don't get a chance to see exactly what it's going to look like, but um, anything is better than nothing, that's for sure. Absolutely, and speaking of anything better than nothing, how about Brandon Brooks and Lane Johnson both on the practice field now? I mean, that's got to be a good sign considering they both had surgeries and injuries that I think most people would assume they would have been out for longer than this. Yeah, I mean, they both indicated that they're, um, that they're doing well and that they're fully healthy. But, again, it remains to be seen. I mean, Brandon's had some issues in the last couple of years, two torn Achilles tendons, a shoulder injury that required surgery. Lane Johnson's ankle was pretty much falling off last year, it seemed like. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's good to see those guys back and uh, – if they can stay healthy, then they got a pretty good. They got the makings of a pretty good offensive line. But again, you know, it remains to be seen if they can stay on the field. Now, it per, the perception is now obviously, like you said, we don't know all the details yet because we've only seen so much. It's not like they're out there letting the media like film all a practice or anything. You know how Correct. that goes. But uh, what we do know is that it seems like that the coaches are taking a much more hands-on approach with the young receivers, and you have to wonder. Is this team just going to say we're not going to bring in a veteran receiver because we're going to focus on letting the young guys develop and see what we actually have in house instead of potentially, as some Eagle fans want them to do, suck up, take the fifteen million dollar hit, and go get Julio Jones? Um, and there can be an argument made for that, I guess. Although I don't know that Julio would want to come here. Um, I know money talks, obviously, but. Um, that's why I was kind of surprised that Ryan Kerrigan did too. I mean, he talked about the culture and the vibe that he got. Fletcher Cox reached out to him, uh, Brandon Graham. So he kind of like recruited him, so to speak. But if I'm a veteran player and I'm looking to make one last push for, to try and win a championship, I don't know that Philly is the place I want to be. Um, you know, things could obviously change. They could be better than what people anticipated. I still see them as a four five, six win team. And, um, if I'm in my thirties and I'm looking to, to try and win a championship before I retire, I don't think I'm picking the Eagles. Yeah. The Julio Jones thing is strange too, because now from his own mouth, what he said on FS one was, I want to win. I want to go to a winner. Well then don't go over to Walt Whitman version. Well, well he also said, <laughs> well, he also said he doesn't want to go to the Cowboys either. So we could read into that what you will as well. But you know, sure. I, I think there's something said to the fact that, the NFC East, in my opinion, Dave, I think it'll be better in 2021, but I don't think whoever wins the NFC East is going to be a Super Bowl contender. I think that's fair to say, right? Uh, yeah, very fair. Um, you know, of course, things can change, and you know, you never know what team is going to come out of the come out of the pack and, and maybe make a put, make a playoff run, make a push. I mean, I don't think too many people expected the Eagles to make their run that they did in 2017, based on what happened on 2016 and 2016. So. You know, stranger things have happened, but I would think the Eagles are at least a year, maybe two away from being a legitimate uh, playoff contender, I think. And listen, being a year or two away is not always a bad thing as long as your trajectory no. is going up. As long as the trajectory is you're, you're better in 2021 than you were in 2020, 
you know, at least you're moving in the right direction. Like, for example, when Chip Kelly got fired, nobody wanted to see them be worse than 2015. So, you know, at least as long as you're making the right moves and going the right direction, it's good. It's when you stay the same or regress, that's when, you know, people start, you know, you know, r- gripping their hands extra tight and, you know, grinding their teeth. Right. And I had this conversation with someone the other day where I think Eagles fans, they just want a reason to be excited. They want a reason to to tune in every Sunday to watch their favorite team. Um, I don't I know that they obviously want the team to win and they'd be disappointed if they did, you know, finish with four or five, six wins or whatever. But if they're showing signs of progress, if they're showing signs of improvement as the year goes on, you know, if if, uh, Jalen Hurts proves that he can be a legitimate franchise quarterback. Um, that's going to go a long way to, to appeasing the fans, I think, more than so, more so than, you know, not making the playoffs or whatever. So if they can, like you said, if they can just make progress and show improvement over the year, I think they'll be okay. Dave Weinberg joining us here for a Weinberg Wednesday here on Game Night on 97.3 ESPN at Dave Weinberg19 on Twitter. Check out his extra point columns over at 97.3 ESPN.com. Dave, the last time you and I talked here on the air, Fury was supposed to fight Joshua. Now, Mm -hmm. (laughs) the whole thing has been turned on its head. And now it's Fury versus Wilder. It's Joshua fighting a guy that I've never heard of in my life. So, you know, what what is your latest perspective on this this heavyweight fiasco? Well, as I I said earlier, um, you never can uh, start believing that something's going to happen, especially in the heavyweight division, until those two guys actually get into the ring together. Um, you know, people want to see uh, Fury and, and Joshua, but the the powers that be, the various sanctioning organizations, they all have their own little sideshows, their own little uh, back backdoor deals, if you will, backroom deals. And um, as a result, this is what you get. And, and it's not just the heavyweight division. It's almost every division where guys have mandatory defenses that come out of the woodwork. Um Fights that, they, that you really weren't expecting to happen. They wind up, they have to fight this guy. Then you can fight. It's ridiculous. And so that that's, I, I, I'd i like to say I'm surprised, but I'm really not. I've, I've seen this happen so often in boxing that um, it's just par for the course, unfortunately. I mean, I don't think anybody would ever think that the, the heavyweights today are on par with anything we've seen in the history of the sport. But, you know, what, what do you feel about the, the three big names at heavyweight right now? You know, what, what is really their standing, not just in the last, you know, few years, but what is their standing in the overall boxing game right now? Like, how do you view them? Well, you got to start all over. I, mean, I lost your audio there for a minute. I'm sorry. I was just asking, you know, wh- where does the big three heavyweights stand right now in terms of <laughs> boxing? Like, how would you, like, look at them and, you know, quantify them? Fury's number one. Joshua, number two, Wilder, number three. Um, Wilder didn't show. I mean, I like Deontay as a person, and I know, like, the struggle that he's gone through to reach what he did, but he's a very one-dimensional fighter, very limited as a fighter, but he has that knockout power that everybody loves. Still, he's not as technically skilled as either Fury or Joshua, but, again, all you need is a heavyweight. All you need is a punch, and he has that, and, you know, his punch is as good as it gets. So, um but yeah, he didn't show me much against Fury in the second fight. Um, and he claimed that he was, you know, dehydrated or his costume weighed too much or Mark Breland didn't <laughs> didn't train him properly, what have you. He was full of excuses. So I guess I guess maybe they should do it one more time just to to show the public that once and for all that Fury deserves to be the uh, the linear heavyweight champion. Yeah, and maybe you know, maybe you just don't wear uh, a crazy costume when you go out to uh, yeah. There you go. go. The ring, Try you know? maybe just wear wear a towel like Mike Tyson used to. Yeah, right? Well, that's to say, back in the day, guys would just go out there with with a with a light robe and they just warm up and they'd run out there and you know yep. we don't we don't yep. we don't need a, a WWE spectacle for uh for boxing for goodness sake. <laughs> Absolutely right. <laughs> now, what was a good thing for boxing was uh, that fight between Taylor and Ramirez. Oh man, on that was Saturday. Awesome. I mean, Taylor put on a show and. I always love it when a fight exceeds expectations, Dave, because for me, listen, I look at boxing and I enjoy it. But for me, as someone who's not a diehard boxing guy, I just want to be walk in there and get a good show. And I feel Taylor and Ramirez gave you more than just a good show. They gave you something to remember. 
Oh yeah, that's a, that's a, absolutely a contender for fight of the year, I think. Um, yeah, Taylor did what he had to do. I mean, showed surprising power by dropping Ramirez twice, but Ramirez showed his uh, his willpower and his uh, determination by getting up both times. I honestly thought Ramirez might have won the fight. I know I was in the minority that way, but it just seemed like Taylor dominated two of the rounds, but there were also a lot of rounds where Ramirez kind of dictated the pace, and he imposed his will, I thought, by pressing the action and stuff, but um, in either case, I mean, I had no argument either way, and both guys fought a terrific fight, and like you said, that's kind of the, that's the kind of thing that boxing needs, uh, you know, terrific fights, uh, not this, you know, first round knockouts, you know, they get a lot of attention and YouTube hits and what have you, but um, it's two legitimate, undefeated world champions going at it for 12 rounds that that that's the that's what boxing really needs to happen yeah and also the fact that i mean what's ironic is people love knockouts but yet every great sport boxing movie is a fight that goes like 10 15 <laughs> rounds right so it's that's like true. you yeah, know yeah. Our, our, we, we want our movies to be you know uh you know mickey gall toro Gar- Gotti. you know we want rocky to go you know, the distance with uh <laughs> Uh, with a Drago, but then in real life, right. he went a knockout. James, so J, James J. Braddock on the distance and Cinderella Man. <laughs> right, yeah, right. Yep, you're right. <laughs> but, but to me, like you said, like this was a fight of the year. And to me, this is what boxing needs more of. We need more just, just beautiful technique and beautiful skill out there. Because I think to me, I think that's what gets lost in translation sometimes when it comes to marketing the sport. Yeah, and ideally, I mean, you don't want, I guess... Uh, a knockout is, uh, you know, it is pretty exciting and it's shocking when it happens, especially in a fight, like if it were to happen in a fight like that. But you're right. I mean, to have two guys that are superbly skilled, uh, they have power, but they also have defense. They also have a jab. They also know how to maneuver around the ring. Um, guys that have, uh, that are so well-rounded that they can do anything that they need to do in order to pull out a win. Um, those are, you're right. Those are the exciting fights. Those are the, um, those are the top of the top of the line fights that, that make boxing such a special sport. Um, casual fans, maybe they do prefer knockouts and I have no problem with that too. I mean, you know, Mike Tyson had people at the edge of their seats, no matter whenever he were, walked into the ring. And, um, there's a, there's a place for that too, but I, I prefer like the type of fight we saw last uh, Saturday night. Now, I was having a conversation, full disclosure, with my mother over the weekend about boxing movies. So I want to ask you, Dave, uh, do you have any specific movies that you think are the best boxing movies? And do you also have a movie that you're like, that was a horrible boxing movie? Oh, my gosh. Uh, (laughs) There's one that probably you probably don't know of uh, called Digstown. And it had uh, Louis Gossett Jr., and I forget the guy's name, uh, James. He plays this man. So anyway, it's, about, it's a movie about this uh, kind of a barnstorming heavyweight who uh, goes and fights in, like, you know, bars and barns and all of the way places. It's a very entertaining movie. Heather Graham is in it, too, which makes it even better. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm, Rocky One, I think, is fantastic. That's one of my favorites. A Cinderella Man is one of my favorites. Um, Million Dollar Baby, um, I liked up until the end. I thought right, it got right. a little, um, uh, it was hard to watch at the end. And uh, But yeah, and The Champ, I mean, everybody cries at that with uh, Ricky Schroeder and uh, John Boyd. Um, I, I don't know of one that I really dislike. I'm trying to think. Um, I've seen an awful lot of them. I kind of thought like like Rocky 17 was a little <laughs> over the top. But, <laughs> um I thought they kind of, uh, you know, took that franchise a little too far. Although the Creed movies apparently are pretty good, so maybe it's coming back a little bit. I don't know. Yeah, How about you? What did you decide on? Well, so for me, I was – the whole conversation started because I was saying that you mentioned Million Dollar Baby. The ending is, like, so atypical of, like, the modern movie because mm-hmm. it's, like, yeah. at the end, it's, like, it's so sad. And you're, like, wait a minute. We just went through all of that, and, and now – Clint Eastwood is depressed all over again. All right. Well, that was, that was, that was a, <laughs> right. not a, not, not the, not the movie I was expecting at all. Um, Absolutely. Not that I hated it, but it was just like the ending right, was right. just so Correct. shocking. You know what I mean? Correct. Yep. So uh, for me now, I did like the Creed movies um, because of the fact that I felt it was a completely different story. Mm-hmm. And sure. the, the way they played it out was different, even though they kind of kept it in the Rocky universe. 
Um, I'm with you. I like Rocky one, but I also like Rocky two as well. I, okay, I like, yeah, me too. I, I like the redemption story. Um, I'm with you. I think Rocky five and Rocky six are completely stupid and useless. Mm-hmm. I do love yep. Cinderella Man, but I also love Russell Crowe. So that kind of uh, it goes hand in hand. Uh, I sure. also like the fighter with Mark Mark Wahlberg because I think that uh, okay Mark and Christian Bale did incredible jobs at portraying real world people, and I think they both just took those characters and embodied them. Oh, okay, very good. All right. So that's that's kind of where I went with those kind of movies. So and it was funny because the, the reason why the conversation came up is because we were talking about how a Million Dollar Baby has that ending that's like. Not a, a normal movie ending, you know. It, whereas mm-hmm. the other boxing, you know, usually a movie is it, the storyline is something along the lines of fighter has something to overcome, fighter yeah. has to w- work uphill, fighter, you know, has a, a victorious moment in the end, and they all <laughs> live happily ever after the end. And it's just how you tell that story is what makes the difference. That's true. Yeah, yeah. they're very. Uh, they pretty much follow the same script, although there are some people like. Like you said, uh, Million Dollar Baby kind of ventures away from that, uh, makes people a little uncomfortable, but there's nothing wrong with that it's sometimes. Sometimes you need to be surprised in life, you know? Uh, absolutely. Uh, Dave, one more before I let you go, and I appreciate you jumping on as always. Sure. Um, obviously, the other side of the boxing conversation is, um, Dave, is Manny Pacquiao that broke that he's going to fight Earl Spence? Uh, I don't. I, there's like, there's some guys who just don't know when to let it go. And as I've, we've talked about before, I'm not the one to tell somebody to hang it up. I mean, the fighter knows when he's had enough, I guess, and far be it for me to tell them when they shouldn't, but that's just, a, that's going to be a trap. That's going to be a farce. Um, Manny can still beat a lot of guys, but Errol Spence is not one of them. Um, right. And I just don't, don't, I don't understand the point other than maybe money. I don't know. Maybe he is broke. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like I said, I I don't. I'm not trying to hate on the guy, but I just feel like at some point mm-hmm. you you just you just gotta own your mortality as an athlete. And I feel like right. you know some guys. Like I understand if you play like a sport like baseball or basketball, like you want to hang on a little bit more because you know it's not like boxing. Boxing, you know, fighting the fight game, you get punched in the face. You know, it's a totally different right. animal. Like Anderson Silva in MMA came out recently and said, "Listen, I'm done with MMA. MMA has passed me by," and he owned it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And yep. I feel like Manny, Manny needs to own the fact that he's not ma- the Manny Pacquiao. He ain't Pac-Man anymore. He's Manny Pacquiao, the politician, philanthropist, and guy who apparently still wants a spotlight. Right, right. I mean, I might have mentioned this before, but I have the utmost respect for uh, Chuck Masakio from Wildwood. Mm-hmm. Um, had a very good boxing career for him, made, made a uh, pretty good living at it. Didn't quite get to the upper echelon, but one one more than the share of fights. He was like 19 and four, maybe, but his last fight, um, when he lost to the guy that he knew in his prime, he would win easily, but he saw shots that he couldn't escape. Um, when he threw, threw punches, they were way too slow. He thought, and he, when he, when the other guy had his, uh, hand raised, Chuck knew that he was time. He was done. He said, if I can't be the best or even a close facsimile to what I was, then it's time to leave the game. And he did. And credit to him, you know, he's never looked back. He's Dave Weinberg. Dave Weinberg19 on Twitter. Check out his extra point columns over at 973ESPN.com. And don't forget about the podcast, The Stealing <laughs> Touchdowns with Dave Weinberg. And as all guests, he appears each and every Wednesday for a Weinberg Wednesday on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Dave, great stuff. Appreciate the conversation today. Anytime, Josh. Thanks for having me as always. Talk to you next week.